All right, so I'm currently on the phone with Half-Life Crisis. I'm going to go ahead and give him the chance to introduce himself. What's going on, everybody? My name is Wesley Jaffery, artistically known as Half-Life Crisis. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be on your show, man. Excellent. Thank you. Um, all right. Well, let's kind of get into it. Uh, why don't you tell me about, you know, how you first came in contact with music? You know, what about it, you know, reached into you and made you want to pursue a life with it? Well, there's two things, man. I uh, had a neighbor that actually has some fame on the south side of Chicago named Joe Jammer. Um, this dude used to always be playing guitar on his front porch. Uh, we used to have this neighborhood event called Burn the Witch, where people would go door to door chanting Burn the Witch on Halloween and then inevitably end up by train tracks. And then they would light a witch made of uh, fireworks on fire. And this dude was always playing guitar and like these crazy skeleton morph suits. And it always appealed to me. So, I mean, one thing led to another. We started talking. He told me he had this program called the Music Marines, where he was a guitar instructor, uh, started taking lessons through him. And actually, previous to that, you know the game Guitar Hero, naturally, right? Mm-hmm, sure. The song uh, More Than a Feeling by Boston, I remember playing it on Expert consistently and doing good on it. And it's like, I want to translate that to a real guitar. Something mm-hmm. about that song specifically stood out to me. And I never did learn how to play it properly on guitar 14 years later. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can, so... I can, Yes, it, but you know. So would you say that that's kind of an interest that came to you a little bit later, like maybe in your teenage years rather than, you know, uh, as a child kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, I would say so. I mean, as a child, I remember listening to Kiss because my dad was a huge fan and just playing a fucking broom. Don't know if you can swear in here. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> that's okay. If you have to edit that, my apologies. That's um, no, but a broom was my first guitar, you know, at the age of like okay. six years old. So it's kind of always been there in the background. Okay, so tell me a bit about the process of translating, you know, the muscle memory skill of Guitar Hero onto an actual guitar and then becoming creative with it. I mean, I would say there's no actual translation because it just flat out doesn't work. It's five plastic buttons. But uh, I did learn drums because of Rock Band. That actually is a transferable skill set. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, it wasn't so much that it, I mean, it gave you a concept of what, like, a hammer-on and a pull-off felt like, I guess, is the only parallel I could actually draw, but... Okay, so... It's just, like, seeing the crowd in that cheesy game, dude, and just, you know, <laughs> just the experience of playing these great classic rock songs, just, it spoke to me, you know? Okay, so, when you did kind of pick up uh, an actual guitar, and kind of realize, you know, the translational differences, what was kind of your beginning process to learn guitar? Did you do, like, traditional one-on-one lessons, lessons or did you do, like, tabulature? A uh, little of both. Uh, that gentleman I was speaking of, Joe Jammer, uh, you know, he took me under his wing. He was like my first mentor in music, as it were. Um, you know, he started by showing me an E major chord. Then the following week, it was an A major, then a D. And then we just worked our way through the major chords and a few minors. Mm-hmm. And then to be honest with you, you know, you had mentioned tabulature. I sort of gravitated towards that. And when it came time to learn theory, I just kind of let it go in one ear out the other. And I'm still kind of stubborn in that way. You know, I can grasp some of the fundamentals of it, but I've always been by ear and by feel, you know? Okay, sure. So to you, it's kind of more of a intuitive thing than it, it's a learned thing. A little of both. Okay. Um, so tell me about the process of, you know, once you were comfortable, uh, you know, playing guitar and everything, uh, entering into like the creative practice of it. Like when did you feel comfortable enough with the instrument to begin writing your own material? Oh, I would say, to be honest, that took really late in life. I mean, I was in various bands uh, from like the age of 15, did my first performance at an eighth grade talent show, which is a train wreck. We went to do this song Behind Blue Eyes by The Who. You familiar with that? Oh, sure. Yeah. Okay. So like we were going to do it and like we rehearsed it where there's a breakdown in it where like there's a guitar solo. And then it was me and my boy, Joe Mendoza. Long story short, he uh, ended up being egged on by the crowd to sing and though he had not practiced vocals and this was the time he was going through puberty and his voice cracked at least 14 times during this performance you know but uh as far as i mean i was in various bands for many years um and more recently i started you know i also part of my story is addiction being an alcoholic um I guess I would say when I got into AA about 2 years ago was when I started actually taking creative control of things um I started this project, Half-Life Crisis, which basically has to do with, uh, you know, psych medication has half-lives. And like when it's not working right, you can go through a bit of a personal crisis. Um, and also the whole concept of not thinking I was going to live that long, that when I started, it was only already halfway through my life. Um, but anyways, like in 2020 is when I started doing it. Uh, the first song I did was called Oblivious. It was 
a song that I did in a previous band called Downfall of Society. Went to the studio. Uh, are you familiar with the Broken Robots by any chance? Uh, I don't think so. It doesn't sound familiar. Amazing local band. Um, but I went to a Hot Mess Records and recorded this song. Um, found myself a year later, no, less than that, maybe six months later in the studio again with my buddy Jason Kluss. Which this story could take all day, so I'm just going to touch briefly on it. We were invited to Eminem's old mansion, this is Noble, to uh, write a song. And like in the dead of the night, this guy said he had the lyrical idea. I'm like, okay, I'm going to pick him up. We're going out to the mansion. And uh, we wrote this second release there. And basically, this song features my friend Schizo Friendly, uh, a.k.a. Jason Kluss, on the rhythm guitar, the vocals. I did the lead guitar and the bass. And then I had a friend named House, who's an up-and-coming rapper, who just happened to be in studio with me that day, tagging along. And he was like, can I be on the song? And I'm like, you know what, why not? You know? One thing led to another. So what I found, I mean, I am in the process of forming a cover band currently, but like, I don't think like, this organization that could possibly be a part of it, you know? Sure. And it's like, I find it's much easier to take a Trent Reznor approach right now and just do the recording myself, collab with people, uh, you know, produce it a little bit. And then if the time's right, get a band behind it and then take those songs somewhere. Sure. Well, let's let's talk about that a bit more. You said your project is Half-Life Crisis. You've kind of given some context of to what that means to you. Um, so how much material do you have? Are you waiting to have like a full EP together before you start releasing things? Or what do you think that'll look like? Uh, to be honest, right now I'm just doing the singles approach, but I do plan on eventually getting an album out there. Um, right now there's two singles that are available on Spotify. Another one's dropping May 12th called Baby Girl. Um, and the thing I do, it's, it's all different genres too. I'm not trying to stay in one lane. I don't know if it's going to be a good thing or a bad thing when all, when it's all said and done. But, uh, as far as material, I got that song, baby girl coming out. There's a song called bankrupt idealist, which is more of a metal song, uh, featuring the singer of its band, sinister fate. Uh, I have another one in the pipeline after that. And they're just coming to me. I mean, I'm working right now in an Alice in Chains style ballad right now called, uh, why, why even bother? Okay. I'm just sort of, you know, I'm basically doing this cover band to fund the studio time because you know it's not cheap, and I'm just seeing where yeah. it goes because I got sobriety now, and that's something I'm not used to, and I just want to see how much I could utilize this newfound life, I guess. So do you think for the foreseeable future, you'll kind of lean into that uh, single release strategy rather than doing like a full EP type thing? More than likely. Okay. Yeah, it seems like that's kind of the way that the industry is going these days, you know, constantly keeping people's attention. Yeah, I mean, you see bands like Iron Maiden even playing into that, man, Metallica on some yeah. two seasons just did the same thing. Yeah, absolutely. So where do you want to uh, see all of this go? What do you want out of this project in five or ten years? If I'm being completely honest, man, I want to be a producer with the same, I want to be in the same lane as Rick Rubin when it's all said and done. You know, I just, mm -hmm. I gravitate towards... I don't know. It's just something that feels like my calling, you know, and I want to see how far I can take it. Ideally, I'll have a band together in that time, you know, and be doing these originals. I'm currently going to open mics now. Um, basically, I took a year and six months off because of mental health difficulties, and I'm finally finding my way back into it. So I've decided to start singing as well. So on future releases, I'll be doing vocals. Um, I don't know. I just want to see how far I can take it, man, like every other musician, you know? Sure, absolutely. No expectations, but just have fun with it, you know? Yeah, for sure. And it sounds like you're in that path. You know, you're in the studio, you're writing, and you're getting material together. Um, along those lines, if that's kind of like your end goal to kind of be like a Rick Rubin type figure, have you also kind of stepped into that production role of working with other bands and everything to kind of give them some direction? Uh, you know, I... Not at that capacity, but I was briefly an agent um, for about three years. I had a company called Jeffrey Artist Media in my drinking days. So, I mean, I did what I could to get band shows, studio time, videography, merch, all that good stuff. And like, I guess I took a role in guiding them, but not really shaping their sound in the studio environment, you know. But I mean, I, I would like to do that. I mean, my project is always open to collaboration, you know. Um, doesn't matter the genre, man. Like, I'm honestly open to working with anybody, period. You know, as long as we could all agree on something that sounds good and the final product's what it should be, you know? Yeah, for sure. I think that's exactly, you know, the attitude that is beneficial and productive. That's good. Um, I appreciate you saying that. 
All right. Well, you told the one story about, you know, uh, the mansion. Uh, what are a couple other of your, you know, pivotal memories about music that kind of just keep you, you know, in the reins and motivated? I don't know about uh, the first story that comes to mind. It's just kind of a goofy one. Uh, you're aware of Afro Man, obviously, right? This is just one of those one offs. And I've had my fair share of encounters with celebrities. Um, but this was just funny to me. I was living in Midlothian, Illinois, and like I was across the street from a venue called Cheers. Are you familiar with it? Uh, no, not that place, no. It was a really good venue, man. Um, I think COVID took it out. But basically, the promoter calls me up one day, and he's like, hey, man, you live across the street from Cheers, right? I'm like, yeah. He's like, well, Afro Man needs to borrow a guitar. Can he use yours? And I'm like, no shit, Afro Man can use my guitar, you know? <laughs> For sure. And uh, yeah, no, he ended up like an idiot. I forgot to bring a strap, so we had to sit down when he played it, you know? Um, I've had moments where I met Tommy Lee from Molly crew at Brower house. I was just talking some smack, got backstage or smoking a few bolts with some guys. And then uh, I kind of rubbed him the wrong way by just coming across as paparazzi, you know, but he shook my hand as a courtesy, you know? And yeah, I mean, I don't know that just, there's no life like being in music, man. You know what I'm saying? Like if you're serious about it, man, I used to go to two shows a week. I mean, there's countless good stories and memories of that, you know? Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting scene to be in. Um, in my local scene, I try to stay out of the politics and stuff of it because I want to promote everybody. Um, but yeah, it's being in music is it's it's unreal. Um, all right, well, wh- where are you located? Uh, I'm in Minneapolis. Okay, different scene. All right. So what are some social media links where people can find you and, you know, check out what you're doing? Certainly. Uh, currently, you could find me at Half-Life Crisis, uh, just as it sounds, on Facebook. Uh, I have three singles. There's actually one I collaborated with a gentleman, Schizo Friendly, on another one of his releases. So there's three singles on Spotify, YouTube, Deezer, all the other ones that we're on that we know nothing of just because of Distro Kid. Um And also, I do have, if interested, there's a social media group uh, on Facebook called Crisis Kids, which is basically uh, just a collaborative group. I'm trying to get people to just come together um, and just collab on musical ideas. You know, there's people in the UK, there's people in South Africa, South America, multiple states. And it's just like, it's becoming a kind of cool networking tool, you know? All right. Well, I always like to give the person I'm interviewing the opportunity to put out their last word. So a message you want to throw out there that, you know, you feel you resonate with. Uh, First thing that comes to mind is aspire to inspire before you expire. 